This is the story of the sound of modern pop. My name is James Bellardi. I'm a music journalist, and when I was a teenager in the 1990s, modern pop was in its infancy. It was a time when aspiring singers became more and more reliant on teams of songwriters to stand any chance of reaching the top of the charts. Modern pop was the sound of school discos, Saturday morning television, and my big sister's bedroom. I'd always assumed it was written in London, or New York, or LA. But in reality, a staggering proportion of the biggest hits from the last 30 years have actually been crafted in this cold, dark corner of Northern Europe called Sweden. Today, what we know to be modern pop is actually a smorgasbord of melodic minimalism, epic hooks and drops, melancholy, euphoria, mathematical algorithms, and Scandinavian folklore. How did this pop come to dominate our charts without us even knowing where it came from? It's a tale that begins with one man's dream of sonic perfection, and it ends with Sweden becoming a global musical superpower. Believe it or not, this place is the biggest exporter of pop music per capita of any country on the planet. In the 1990s, a visionary band of Swedish songwriters and producers staged a coup on the global charts that would change pop music forever. In this film, I'll be examining the tracks that turn Sweden into an unstoppable musical force, meeting the masterminds responsible for the most potent melodies of our time, understanding the last three decades of pop through the myths and legends of the land of the midnight sun. So what can we learn about a country from the popular music that it produces? The lyrics might tell us something about the hopes and dreams of its population. The rhythm and the melody might give a sense of the mood within a nation's borders. But there are also clues in the way that the music is produced and crucially, who it is being made for. Sweden's musical revolution began when club culture arrived in the 1980s a time when Swedes found an escape from the country's notoriously bitter winter evenings. At the heart of the musical underground was the Ritz nightclub, quite literally underground in a subway station in a working-class district of Stockholm. Amongst the DJs at the Ritz was the blonde mulleted Dag Voller. He and the other Ritz DJs had heard the latest remixes pumping out of the US and UK, very Swedishly, they didn't so much think that they could do better, just rearrange the songs in a more Swedish way. They formed Swemix, a record label pumping out its own remixes, more finely attuned to Stockholm's clubbers. It was kind of like a music collective, and it was like a big family. People came in, hey, you want to throw down a rap? We wanted to be New Yorkers. We sort of tried to fit into that, you know, like, we're good too, man. That's why we have this slightly American accent. This is the original Swemix studio. Stonebridge was also uh, one of Swemix's founding the DJs. The Along with office manager Jeanette Von der Berg, he took me to see the company's former studio. Are the facilities comfortable? <laughs> <laughs> no, they had like a bed spread or something hanging to take down the sounds. And the singing booth was just a corridor, and we had to stop singing when someone flushed. What do you mean, flushed? When someone flushed the toilet. Swemix aimed to capture the sound of the Stockholm underground, but Doug Voller had other ideas. He wanted to make music that was popular with the masses, and he made his intentions clear when he decided to change his name. Doug's new moniker, Dennis Pop, would go against everything that the other Swemix DJs stood for. I mean, Dennis Pop, we were scandalized that the guy picked Dennis Pop because you could not mention the word pop. It was like, stop the knock, you know, you definitely not. But Dennis, he knew what the people liked. 
The key to Swemix's success was its unashamedly democratic approach. The remixes that got the best reception in the Ritz nightclub were released on white label vinyl. And Stockholm's club has proved to be a surprisingly reliable barometer of popular taste. Three years earlier, US soul diva Robin S had released the song Show Me Love and it sank without a trace. After a sprinkling of Swemix stardust, Stonebridge's remix of Show Me Love would propel Robin S into the US and UK top 10. We took melody tradition from the UK, we took like beats from America. Oh, that's funky. Little reverb. And I added two chords. And I basically mixed it down, turning them into something Swedish. You know. And then it just exploded. In our haste to make it very Swedish, we also make it very appealing to other nations. But Dennis Pop's ambitions for mass appeal meant going well beyond simply improving songs that had been written by others. He knew he'd have to write his own music, perfect pop music, in order to enchant the widest possible audience. I was more interested in cool things, you know, like jazzy, funky. Whereas for Dennis, the challenge was to create the perfect pop song. He never thought twice about cool, you know. Actually, if it was cool, it was shit. Dennis Pop and the Stockholm Underground were about to receive an icy blast of Scandi folk reggae fusion from the country's north, courtesy of Ace of Bass. Not unlike ABBA, the band consisted of two captivating female singers, backed by two blokes. It was my brother, my sister, and, and actually my former boyfriend, so that was like, wow. <laughs> wow, what a crowd. We came from a very simple town called Gothenburg and we sent a lot of cassettes, posted it to the, the record labels all over. For Ace of Bass, getting noticed by Dennis Pop was a stroke of good fortune owed to a dodgy car stereo. Well, uh, my name is Dennis Pop. I got a cassette sent to my house saying, please listen to our demos and uh, call us. Eventually, the tape have got to Dennis he took, put it in his car. And it got stuck, so I kept hearing it. Every time I drove in that car, I kept hearing the same song. At that time, it was called Mr. Ace. I'm Mr. Ace, I'm running my base. So he was actually stuck with our tape for over six months. Whether he wanted it or not. So when we called them, yeah, you know, as Dennis has actually wanted to be in contact with you for a while but he's occupied now. He's in the studio with a dentist. And we were like, so frustrated. We finally found the guy we wanted to work with. What is he doing with a dentist when you have these four great guys and girls from Gothenburg? So this dentist was Dr. Alban. Dr. Alban was a local Nigerian dentist with a sideline in rapping. It's my life. It's my life. After spotting Alban performing on Stockholm's club circuit, Dennis saw a route from the underground to the mainstream. Där skulle du kunna vänta lite längre innan du säger det här. Make this world a better place. Att du drar ut lite längre på det så att det kommer lite senare. Okej. Då tycker du att det är fel eller vad då? Nej, det är inte fel. Det bara att det ska bli lite mer häng så att det sänger okay. lite. All right, all right. Får höra en gång i micken bara. Few could have predicted that Dr. Alban's obvious natural talent with the mic, coupled with Dennis's keen ear for a hit sound, would be such an explosive combination. It's My Life erupted across Europe, reaching number one in seven countries. And it was thanks to a legendary advert that the track broke in the UK, peaking at number two in the charts. It's not only more discreet, but its plastic applicator makes it even easier to use. Tampax Freedom. Why compromise? Meanwhile, Ace of Base had been waiting patiently. After five months, they finally had a call from Dennis Pop. The band's raw demo was about to be transformed into an international smash hit. Dennis had his idea what he wanted to do with it to make it work on the dance floor. Dennis had learned at the Ritz nightclub 
that the simplest melodies, choruses and hooks had the biggest impact on the crowd. All he had to do was convince the band of his musical vision. He said that we have to cut the rap out of it. And he's like, well, then we cut the rap. Kill your own darlings. If it's crap, it's crap. After stripping out the non-essentials, Dennis had turned Ace of Bass's Gothenburg dirge into a pop phenomenon. All That She Wants thundered to number one in 13 countries, including the UK. In the United States, it peaked at number two. Perhaps most remarkable of all is that no one seemed to mind the song's puzzling lyrics. Baby for us is obviously is not a baby like this. She's a manhunter. She's looking for happiness, and uh, she actually gets less and less happy. So the baby is another man in her life. At that time, did you know that to English ears that would sound a bit weird? Uh, no, uh, it didn't matter uh, too much to us because we thought it sounded good. People have said that English is the biggest language in the world. But I would say that the bad English is the biggest language in the world because that's the way you talk in English when you travel or writing emails. As a Swede, you don't realize that lyrics like Baby One More Time or that you want doesn't make sense because from our perspective, we assume that is the way you talk. An applause for Dennis Pop. Dennis was now on his way to becoming the most successful Swedish musical sensation since ABBA. Ace of Bass's record, The Sign, had become the fastest selling debut album of all time, shifting 25 million copies worldwide. But in ultra equal Sweden, Dennis knew that it's rarely wise to trumpet one's own achievements. Have you been like rich as Ace of Bass or Dr. Alban? Jag har pengar. Jag är ingen sån här... Jag sitter inte och räknar pengar direkt, utan jag tycker det är mer... Det är så mycket för mig är det kicken. Nej, men, kicken för mig är att veta liksom, ja, här har jag, jag har gjort en låt och just nu är det 2-3 miljoner fötter som dansar till den här låten ikväll. Och det har jag gjort i en källare på Söder. Det, det ger mig fullständig tillfredsställelse. Det här med pengar, det kommer liksom... Det kommer sen. It was the beginning of a long and uneasy relationship with the spotlight of success. Dennis wasn't just content being the backroom guy, he actually preferred it. It was the ideal solution to detract from the embarrassment of his newfound wealth. Back at Swemix, the other DJs felt Dennis's quest for mass appeal undermined their cool image. The uneasy truce between pop and the underground finally broke down. Spurred on by what he had achieved, Dennis's next venture with Sharon Studios. Here, he would recruit an elite band of eight disciples that would change the world of pop forever. Each one was to be molded in his image, tasked with practicing his musical doctrine. The first disciple was Tottenham-born rapper Herbie Critchlow. Having grown up in Barbados, meeting Dennis Pop was an unforgettable experience. You're in tropical Barbados, yeah. and you end up in snowy, freezing, cold Stockholm. It was weird. I mean, you gotta remember, I came from paradise. You know, monkeys and hot sun and surfing and the beach and wake up one morning, I'm in a freezer. I remember this night, man. I was walking around town and had this weird feeling. Go in that place over there and go down the stairs. They're full of white people. They, them brothers is jumping kind of great. I know, uh -uh, I'm gonna go down. And I got to the front door and the guard was like, yo, come in, man. It was so packed. And this dude was playing the dopest old school funk. And the dude just turns around to me. You drinking? I said, yeah, I pulled a shot. I went back there every night for about a week. And every time I got there, we didn't talk. He just poured me some shots. And then it was Friday night. He took up the microphone and he goes, can you rap? And I went, can I what? He goes, can you rap? Give me the mic, give me the, give me the mic, give me the mic. Mr. Magoo, you may be blind, but I can still see you. Anytime you see bad boy come. That was the beginning of my friendship with Dennis Pop. Here I am all night. Amongst other key employees was trainee producer and all-round dog's body, Martin Sandberg. 
So he was like, yeah, kind of the tea boy, Dennis Slave, yeah. But not in a bad way in that sense, no. He was, he was uh, learning the trade. Sandberg had come to the attention of Dennis Pop as the lead singer of struggling glam metal band It's Alive. It's Alive were boisterous and blasphemous, but the real Martin Sandberg was awkward and shy. He played heavy metal, but he also harboured a terrible secret. Martin Sandberg loved pop. In Dennis, Sandberg had found a kindred spirit. Dennis insisted Sandberg also take on a more poppy epithet, and so he was renamed. This here is Max Martin. That's a good one. That's a nice one. one. That's a nice one. Max Martin was obsessed with melody. How did it work? What made some melodies catchier than others? It's a love he had first acquired in state-funded music school. Och det är inte. Jag gillar det. Sen var det många som hoppar. Det är ju otroligt många som hoppar av och när det blir mer intresserad av brudar eller ishockey från jag liksom på skiter det liksom. Men jag satt där och blåste min mögla trumpet. Tyckte det var ganska coolt ändå. Music has long been a key part of the Swedish education system. When Max was at school, he could learn almost any instrument he wanted for next to nothing. This state-funded initiative allowed the brightest and best to blossom, perhaps partly explaining why Swedes are so dominant in the industry today. Is it a big part of the curriculum? Music education has always been quite important. I think everyone had to learn to play the flute and perhaps a guitar, and some people got tired of that, but some of them were Max Martins. Bringing swagger and groove to the troupe was failed singer-songwriter Andreas Carlson. I was kind of totally unaware of what I was getting myself into because here I am, one guitar, no real dance moves, kind of looked like a boy band guy before boy band had actually hit really big again. I understood that, you know, I'm not going to be an artist anymore. I'm going to write for these guys. And there was a bunch of, of people backstage, one guy with blonde long hair that looked like a Viking, and a shorter guy, long hair that looked like a metal singer, which was Max Martin and Dennis Pop. And then I joined their team. He just put together a group of people that had really nothing to do with one another. And he created this gang of brothers, band of brothers. To hold the whole team together, Dennis brought along former Swemix office manager, Jeanette. I was like the supervisor. I was like the mom-ish. It's like a daycare center for semi-grown-ups. Peter Pan, Never Never Land, is it, is it, was that the idea? Yeah, sort of. If you change your mind, take a chance on the first thing line. As well as running the office, Dennis also added backing singer to Jeanette's job description. When I'm singing, I'm adding something that maybe thickens it. You're a thickener. I'm a thickener. Take ABBA, for instance. You have Agneta and you have Annifrid. Agneta has a really crisp, beautiful voice. Annifrid, she thickens it. I'm a thickener. I don't really know how it happened. I was sitting by my desk. I was there, I was available, they knew I could sing. Jeanette, <laughs> come down to Studio One. Sing like this. Okay. I blended in well with all different kinds of voices. Ace of bass. Oh, yeah. it's a beautiful and Britney. Stop! And Robin. And what's the, the English group, boy band? Five. Five. Baby now! We did whatever we wanted musically. We experimented with sound. We took massive risks. In the studio, the team searched for Dennis's perfect pop sound. They began by harking back to Swedish songwriting tradition. This is the ancient art of culming, a herding call. With its simplistic melodies and an absence of rhythm, culming is the root of all Swedish folk music. Swedish folk music is all about And 
And out of that comes, I don't know how, but I saw the sign and it opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. Life is too much. The simplicity of Swedish folk melodies had an oddly universal appeal amongst the record-buying public. Like ABBA, Dennis and Ace of Bass had thrust Swedish musical tradition into the global spotlight. We came in a gap. We're the only ones doing this melodic pop. And specifically in the States, it was a huge gap. It was only soul and it was uh, rap and hard rock. And we made mel melodies. But Dennis knew Swedish tradition alone would not keep the masses satisfied. By the mid-90s, commercial radio was awash with hip-hop, R&B and dance. For the team at Sharon Studios to continue to thrive, their music would ultimately have to get ahead of current trends. Dennis set Max, now a fully-fledged producer in his own right, the task of writing the studio's next hit, to be sung by a 16-year-old Swede called Robin. Dennis is the flavor guy, the guy that played the new records for others. And Martin was the songwriter. They were like sucking in all this inspiration from dance music and, and, and rock music mixed with like a sense of melody and just like putting it together in a new way. I remember when we, when we did Show Me Love and Martin played me that song for the first time, he said, you know, these beats, like I'm really happy with these beats. I've been working on them for a long, I think I cracked something. Like it, for him it was like, this is it. And I remember listening to it and I was like, what is it that he's referring to? Is it R&B or is it, like, for me, like, that's the, really his own interpretation of, I think, pop music, the way it was sounding at the time. Like big melodies, really impactful drops and, like, big pompous energy. I think, in a way, Swedish people are a little bit like the Japanese, like how we can get so obsessed with something and like try to recreate it or imitate it in some way, and then it never becomes what the original is. It becomes another, maybe a little bit weirder and, yeah, stranger version of it. As the hits rolled off the Sharon production line, the studio now began attracting the attention of foreign record labels who wanted their artists to have that unique Sharon sound. That's what we were dreaming about, getting in with a big artist that could really take our music to, to the top of the charts. <laughs> At first they were gonna be called the lads. Got changed to fire. Herbie was sent to the UK by Dennis to meet with an ambitious young record label exec. Simon Cowell called me up one time Flew me to England, Herbie darling. I have this uh, wonderful idea and I have this wonderful band. It's gonna be, be amazing, it's gonna be wonderful. And we had just done Clap Your Hands. Clap your hands. Yeah, move your feet. This is Clap Your Hands, an early experimental Sharon track written by Herbie, Dennis and Max. It was soon to be transformed. I said to me, oh, I've got this idea, but it's, it's nuts. And he goes, well, what is it? I was, we need to connect the guys to some form of sports that connects them to guys, connects them to, in a different way. And he went, what about the NBA? So I went back to Sweden, I told Dennis, and we created this Slam Dunk the Funk. It was a golden age of manufactured boy bands and girl groups. Just by adding a basketball theme to the lyrics, the track went stratospheric. It had a simple melody and it had great beats and it connected with the audience through relatable faces as a front for Dennis's operation. What did we do, 10 million albums? And we got the official song for the NBA. I'm never thinking small again. Crucial to Sharon's success 
was the idea that tracks should work as well on the radio as they did on the dance floor. Each track was tested to destruction in Stockholm's clubs before official release, sometimes with over a hundred different versions. We wouldn't tell anyone. We just tell the DJ, yo, can you play this if you get a chance? This is the frequency for radio. How do we get the most out of that? This is the frequency for clubs, based on the amount of bass in there, the people in the club, how will we soak up the bass, not make the highs so high that it annoys people. Then you have to take into to reference that people are drinking, so their senses are, da are dampened. Is there any truth to the rumor that you guys used to get a track sent out to LA to be driven around in a car to hear what it would sound like on, on a car stereo? Hell yeah! Here we go again with the beats. We got your heads popping, now you're talking from your seats. The car test was very important. Every time when we came to the States, we would work in the studio and then we would put the song in the car and then we would drive around and see how it felt. You got the feeling, jump up to the ceiling, I will get it down tonight. Like, wow, you know, in Sweden, it didn't sound like it should sound. Rather than hard science, the LA car test was perhaps just another of Dennis's eccentricities, but it wasn't entirely without foundation. There's a very important reason why the tracks were sent out to Los Angeles rather than just being driven along the highway in Sweden here. Let me put on the stereo and you'll see why. See out here. This just doesn't sound right. This isn't the sound of snowy Sweden. This is the sound of going to the beach with your mates or hanging out at the mall. Of course, teenagers, specifically American teenagers, buy more music than anyone else. Dennis designed his songs to reflect American lives, at least as far as he understood them, from his studio in faraway Stockholm. Underlying the fun and games at Sharon was always a methodical, systematic approach. Each new experiment brought the team ever closer to creating perfect pop. In time, this analytical process would transform into Dennis's greatest achievement yet. Was there a Sharon formula? Oh, yeah. For example, every third chorus had a B hook. Dennis took that from the name of the game with ABBA. What's the name of the game? It's the name of the game. Which is the verse. And then he kind of made that connect with the last chorus, so it creates this enormous lift. It's actually two choruses going against each other, and we use that for every song. And there was a breakdown part after the second chorus. Then there was always a sound that would be a string wheel, which is, was a pad that sounded like a funeral. And the manic shot, which was a As soon as there was a good sound, that sound went into the Sharon bank, you know. Um, so it, everything became very dressed in this unique Sharon sound. When you listen to those songs that came out of Sharon at the time, you know, it's not the sound of Volvos and saunas and Ikea and all those kind of stereotypical Swedish things. It's the sound of America? Well, I mean, we thought so. I mean, I heard Bills, Bills, Bills with Destiny's Child, and I thought, you know, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to come up with R&B songs that have, you know, titles with three words, and we wrote Bye, Bye, Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye, bye. Does that sound like R&B? No, it sounds like something... It's got that Swedish, rigid, everything perfect. It doesn't have a natural, laid-back R&B feel to it. It's, it's something else. And even though we were heavily influenced by American and British music, I think we came up with something that was quite unique. The Sharon formula was a distinctly Swedish concoction. By taking the best bits from elsewhere and repackaging them in a more pleasingly Swedish fashion, they were aping the tactics of other world-beating Swedish brands. 
There are parallels with the way IKEA and H&M operate because coming from Sweden you don't invent that much maybe but you sort of become very good at scanning the rest of the world and picking the best pieces and try to do a similar version but in a more effective way. Sharon never stopped refining its formula. As time went on, the team enjoyed access to ever more exciting performers to front Dennis's musical vision. Step forward, the Backstreet Boys. Max and Dennis were responsible for the whole birth of Backstreet Boys, our sound, um, I think even kind of helping us find ourselves within our image, within whatever encompassed the Backstreet Boys was Max and Dennis. From 1995, the Backstreet Boys had been a personal passion project for Max. On their debut album, he penned four tracks, scoring number two in the US with Quit Playing Games With My Heart. His sound was always transcending. You know, it was always ahead of the game. Everybody, yeah. Max's determination to make Backstreet a success was formidable, as he demanded from the boys increasingly precise vocal performances to layer over his ever simpler melodies. First thing I learned about Max as a singer was this thing. This freaking <laughs> hand. hand. This hand, <laughs> like, there was a certain rhythm that you had that, that Max heard. And it was, if you were singing it like off or you were singing in your own rhythm, in your own way. It was always on top. Yeah, me. Max would say, no, 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 do it again. Right here, right here. <laughs> As Backstreet Fever spread from continent to continent, fans braved the icy streets of Stockholm outside the pop laboratory where the band's sound was being crafted. I remember coming to the studio. There would be girls feigning, crying, you know, miserable, sleeping in sleeping bags. And they were from Australia, America, England. They were just sitting outside of our studio, hoping that something was gonna happen. But as well as sculpting Backstreet Sound, little did these fans know that the Sharon team were also responsible for writing the hits sung by arch rivals NSYNC, fronted by a young Justin Timberlake. Was it easy to decide when you wrote a new track? Like, is it Backstreet? Is it NSYNC? Are there any borderline tracks? Is it Britney? Uh, I mean, all of those songs could have worked for anyone, really. Everyone there cares about the song. You know, you leave no stone unturned, as the saying goes, to really find what's the best, you know, lyric and melody and production for the song. You think about the music industry, birth of rock and roll, and you feel that the creativity laid with the artists then. What you guys did, we shift that creative power into the studio. We were the creators, and the artists became sort of the voices and, and the faces. Money, money, money. Must be funny in the rich man's world. We were a couple of kids that, you know, very quickly became wealthier than we were before. Probably not unlike a rock band that all of a sudden have their first big hit record and they start buying cars and all of a sudden you move from cars to apartments and homes and the flying first class. I mean, we kind of lost touch a little bit. As the hits continued to flow out of Sharon, the money flowed in. The team were filthy rich, a potential source of social disapproval in Sweden. Having witnessed what happens to Swedes who flaunt their wealth, they were right to be concerned. Sweden is a funny country. We have something called Jantelov. In Sweden, we have this Jante law that you're not supposed to be better than anyone else. In Sweden, Jante law is a social code that emphasizes the good of the community over the individual. It simmers under the surface of everyday living. Those who dare break Jante law can expect scorn. People can see you 
and you're showing off. Don't do that. That is a big law that we have that is hidden inside of us. You have to get across a barrier in Sweden, and that's the Janta law. In the press, we were described as a shame of Sweden. Uh, I rather puke myself in the face and listen to his base. But it didn't really concern us too much, even though, of course, it would have been nice. But being number one in America was nicer. Did you ever write anything mean about Ace of Base? I, I hope I didn't, but all music journalists did. They were definitely considered bad Swedes because they didn't care about the law of Jante. They sort of were uh, sort of pounding their chests and wanted to be seen as superstars. Now Sharon was at its creative peak. The formula had become so effective that practically every melody they touched was transformed into a chart topper. In accordance with Janta law, the team stayed firmly in the background and kept on creating ever more perfect music. The next star on the horizon was now jetting in from Disney's Mickey Mouse Club. She would make the team utterly dominant in the global music market. Her name was Britney Jean Spears. I think we went to a cafe the first day and started talking about music and dreams and whatever. I remember first time hearing her singing. She looked very average. I thought, how is this gonna work? Who's gonna like this? But she was nice and really quiet. Could you sense any star power there? No. But then we received the video. It was like, oh my God. <laughs> once that you should be you should recognize a song after two seconds. Baby One More Time is a really good example of that. Recently drafted into the Sharon team was Jürgen Ellefsen. Jürgen knew exactly how to write for almost any target audience, thanks to years of music biz experience of a sort. As a jingles writer, I fit them like a glove because I did jingles for, you know, commercial radio. One day you did some China restaurant and the next day you did a, you know, car repair or a hard rock song, you know, whatever. The first time I came to the Sharon one, one night and there was nobody there except Dennis who opened the door. And he said, oh, hi, man, come on in. And then he's like, he, he shook my hand and I felt, it felt really strange. It's like, whoa, that was an, that was an important handshake. We made eight songs on that first Britney album. It was like, you know, when you poke an ant pile, you know, suddenly, suddenly there's a lot of movement in the studio. We were like three teams competing on the inside, but facing the outside, the world. We wanted to win together. Max would walk in between and, okay, I like Drive Me Crazy. Maybe you'll refine it, you know, a little bit like that, a little bit like this. And then Jürgen had Sometimes, which was a huge hit. Sometimes I love, sometimes, sometimes I hide. Which was a little different. And then me and Christian had written Born to Make You Happy. Even though the, the three teams took them a little bit differently, it was the Sharon sound in the middle. And that's what the record companies wanted. Those early Britney Spears tracks, it's like a milestone in music history. Something really changed. And Hit Me Baby One More Time. That very effective song, the way it was constructed, I think has influenced all pop music coming since then.
they basically took the choruses from like hair metal, from like Bon Jovi and Def Leppard, those very big choruses, and they put them in like a context with production influenced by hip hop and house music. And no one sort of did that. So by mixing those two, a sort of an unthinkable thing. I think no one in, in the States or Great Britain would have ever done that because it would sit uh, considered bad taste. As a Swede, you could do that. Me, baby, one more time. baby One More Time went to number one in every country that it was released, apart from Iceland for some reason. This was the culmination of Dennis's life's work. He had brought together a team capable of creating his perfect pop sound. The sound of modern pop as we know it today, an inexplicably Swedish mishmash of influences, laser focused to attract the maximum number of listeners. The Sharon formula crafted in this pop laboratory seemed infallible, but just as Britney Spears, its most potent product yet, was exploding on our screens, her creators would suffer a devastating personal loss. He said, uh, it's not good. And I knew. Everything's in slow motion. It was like somebody who gives you everything, gives you the best of them, teaches you everything they know. It's telling you they're leaving now and they're not coming back. It came as a shock. I mean, he was 34 years old, and I just heard that he had this aggressive tumor in his stomach, and um, the first thing that hit me, I thought it was so unfair. I mean, we live in Sweden with like the best health care you can have. I mean, we have the best doctors. But it kind of, we kept on working anyway. That's what he wanted us to do anyway. And then one day I was sitting in the office and I see this guy walk in, and it's Dennis, and he's just so thin, you know, he's lost so many kilos. Hey, Andreas, how are you, you know? You want to listen to some new music that I'm working on? So he takes me into the editing room and, and he starts playing this like really weird music. And I said, what is this? What is it? Oh, this is what I'm going to do next. Wow, I never heard anything like it. We had him for a couple, couple more weeks, maybe two or three weeks, and then he passed away like that. On the 30th of August, 1998, Dennis Pop died, aged just 35. It was like a mirror shattering. It was just, everyone just collapsed. It became very clear that Max was the one who was going to take us through all of this because we had a record to make, and that was the Backstreet Boys Millennium album. That was going to be the record of records. Every song was going to be a hit. Straight after the funeral, we went into the studio and created what I think is still a masterpiece. Show me the meaning of being lonely. Did it change the music that you wrote? No. No. Why? It's not about us. Music was not, it wasn't about us. It would be selfish of us to start writing songs based on something that's happened to us. There's this misconception that Show Me the Meaning of Being Lonely was written about Dennis. It wasn't written about Dennis. A way of saying thank you, Dee, for everything. We'll miss you. Sales are higher than ever. You've got Britney, Backstreet Boys. Did it feel like a contradiction? Felt like an insult. Wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. You're telling me that this dude who just done all of this is gone and business as usual? You 
the creativity it didn't come from the same place anymore. What Dennis had stood for, the culture and the joy and the playfulness, wasn't really there. We were kind of delivering like a factory. I could definitely feel how the mood shifted in the studio. We have to remember that sadness is also quite beautiful. The minor keys you can do more things with. You can actually have a happier melody in a minor key. When you do that right, you, get, you end up with songs like uh, The Winner Takes It All, for instance. Which sounds like pretty much a happy anthem, which is actually the saddest thing in the world. Amid the difficult atmosphere, the Sharon team continued to compose simple melodies, just as Dennis had taught them. Jürgen carved a niche, harnessing the power of sadness. He wrote three UK number ones for Louis Walsh's latest act, Westlife. With Westlife, it was about a sense of melancholy, but also a sense of hope at the same time. I think the combination creates a tension which makes you feel good, but it also reaches your heart. Just happy, happy, it doesn't really go in there, you know? It makes it more like, yeah, yeah, he's cool, you know? But to hit your heart, it needs to have something else. There needs to be some sort of a sadness, but it doesn't mean sadness in a sort of boo-hoo way. Empty street, an empty house, a hole inside my heart. You look at like the National Happiness Index mm -hmm. and how Sweden stacks up against all these other countries, and pretty much you're always coming out on top as one of the happiest nations on the planet. Hmm. They must have rigged it. <laughs> <laughs> you read the book, but the music that Swedes love has got sadness at its heart. Yeah. It's just a mi mindset of the people, I think. There's some sort of a, I don't know, some sort of a minor key. So I say a little prayer, you know my dreams will take me there. I think it's an inner strive that's within the whole soul of Sweden. There's a longing, an inner longing to reach out, to communicate. The guys who did Spotify probably really applied that, you know, to, to make it grow that quickly. And, and the same with IKEA and H&M and all the other multinational Swedish companies. Earth to Mars lander report status, please. In Sharon's brave new post-Dennis world, Max Martin was now in charge creatively. Fresh talent was needed to keep the hit factory running. The new kid on the block was sampling wizard Rami Yacoub, who joined after being spotted by his new mentor, Max. Rami's addition to the Sharon family came as a surprise to some. Nobody told anybody that I started working there. First week, I walked around and everyone was looking at me kind of weird. I was like, who is this guy? And I was like, why are they looking at me? Just to be in, in that place was amazing. I believe everything happens for a reason. But I think in the end, we all still had the, you know, you know, tennis rooted deep in, in us. The Sharon factory continued to churn out hit after hit with breathtaking efficiency. But as its new frontman, Max found the extra attention on him to be increasingly tough. Dennis was quite secretive from the beginning, and I think it rubbed off. Max preferred to let his melodies do the talking. Everything that could possibly be said about his process could be found within the music itself. In Sharon's final years, he gave fewer and fewer interviews until he stopped giving them entirely. The producers who came up in Sweden with Sharon, they considered it their job, we should not be seen, we should be in the background. Our job is to make stars of like Backstreet Boys and Britney Spears. We shouldn't be stars in our own right. And there's also, I think, a quite Swedish mentality. It's like the exact opposite of the American thing, where you should always sort of boost yourself and exaggerate. The Swedish way is, no, no, no. It was the end of the road for the world's number one hit machine. From a basement in Stockholm, Sharon Studios had achieved global domination. But its founder was gone, and with him, the very life and soul of the organization. In death, Dennis could no longer make music for the masses, but his disciples could. Now they would go their separate ways to continue spreading Dennis's gospel. 
At the end of that year, we said probably we should just close this place and, and move on. Eight guys at the top of everything. It's kind of like the Beatles, you know? They have it all and then they do one little performance on the rooftop and that's it. Max Martin now lives in Los Angeles and he's by far and away the most successful songwriter of his and almost every other generation. At his new venture, MXM Studios, Max has surrounded himself with an army of Swedes, each specialising in different areas of the songwriting process. It's a thoroughly Swedish environment, encouraging collaboration and cross-pollination of ideas. The lessons handed down from Dennis to Max are still an important part of the curriculum at MXM. And for the last 18 years, Max and his team have been turbocharging the Chiron formula into a theory they call melodic math. There is a code for taste. There is a code that connects everyone. And I think Max, he's cracked that human code when it comes to pop song. Melodic math, you want every part in the song to have a distinct melody. It's really simple. It's melody math and phrasing math. But at least we'll both be beautiful and stay forever young. For example, if you have a chorus, generally you don't want the chorus notes to be revealed in the verse or the pre-chorus. You want it to feel fresh when it comes in. She told me you never be in And also, this chorus is like bam 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 bam. You don't want the verse to go bam 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 bam, maybe bam bam, like so it feels new. Max and I have worked together for a very long time. His melodies are so incredible and so sophisticated, but simple. Um, but he is very. Um, very specific when it comes to vocals and a bit of a task master. I think Max hears the vocals like an instrument. There's a certain way to sing certain songs that is going to be even catchier and even hookier. We did ask Max Martin for an interview. He responded by saying he preferred all the attention to go on the songs and the artists. It's hard to overstate the importance of Max to modern pop. He's the third most successful songwriter of all time behind only Lennon and McCartney. Got 22 US number ones to his name, yet most people have never even heard of him. But in 2016, in this building behind me, Stockholm's concert hall, he was finally coaxed out of hiding by the Swedish king, Carl Gustav. This is the moment that the sound of modern pop was given the royal seal of approval. When Max Martin was awarded the Polar Music Prize, Sweden's musical version of the Nobel Prize by His Royal Highness King Carl Gustav XVI. Previous winners have included Bob Dylan, Stevie Wonder, Elton John and Paul McCartney. He's one of a kind. He will be remembered as a Mozart, you know, one of the, the greatest uh, composers of the century. Your Majesties, Your Royal Highnesses, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, and the Polar Music Prize jury. Well, you did it. You blew my cover. <laughs> I managed to hide between two speakers in a basement for over 20 years. And then you did this. I have to start with the late Dennis Pop. He made me realize how difficult it is to make things sound simple. Meanwhile, Dennis's other disciples continue to preach the good word. Herbie has recently penned hits for Rita Ora and Zayn Malik, but his heart still lies in the sound of the underground. Get high, get lit, get drunk, get wavy. Get wavy. Listen, let me tell you like this. I got the 
time to span to go boom. Never a dull day when white is in the Oh my god! And Jürgen has struck gold as an epic ballad writer for Simon Cowell's reality TV franchises. Does it have its own unique challenges? Jingle making came into play because it was not just a song. It was the end of a TV show. It was a moment that needed to be, you know, crowned somehow. I'm gonna take this moment and make it last forever. I'm gonna give my heart away and pray we'll stay together. And Andreas has found happiness by opening his very own music school. Look at this place, right? We wanted to create this uh, unique world for the students. I think it's on me to kind of do something good. Success means nothing unless you share it with other people. Rami has carved his own name in the industry, writing for One Direction, Ariana Grande and Madonna. But now, 13 years after parting ways with his mentor, Rami has recently moved to LA to be reunited with Max Martin. It's been almost 13 years since I worked with Max. First thing he said too is like, welcome back to the family. We have a lot of Swedes in LA. It's very much a Swedish community. Like we don't melt, you know, with the rest. Uh, we kind of stick to our bubble and try to make the team under the roof as strong as possible so we can just do it all ourselves. I say hi, you say hi, we stay high, you look so pretty, yeah. Tovalo is part of the next generation of LA-based Swedes. She's a performer and one of an increasing number of female songwriters in a corner of the industry traditionally dominated by older, beardier Swedes. She's a member of Wolf Cousins, the new songwriting collective created by Max Martin in Sharon's image. Wolf Cousins is a kind of joint collaboration between me and eight other Swedish dudes. I've written with Ellie Golding, Girls Aloud, Saturdays, Charlie XX, Lord, a lot of girls. <laughs> no, I don't a type. Dennis Pop, like, if you'd ask me when I was 14, 15, if I thought a 40 year old man could tell me what I thought and, or how I felt, I'd be like, no, you have no idea <laughs> anything of what I've been through. Um, but in a way, obviously, they did know. I like that it's changing. There's so many female producers that are popping up everywhere and we can use our voice, you know, we're same age, we have the same experiences, we can actually tell the story like it is. As Dennis Pop's baton is passed down to another generation, there's seemingly no end to new theories on why the miracle of modern pop happened in Sweden. Perhaps it was the perfect storm of bad weather and stellar musical education. Combined with Yantalor, a love of simple melodies and a curious knack for reformulating the best ideas from other nations and selling it back to them. In truth, all of these things are important, but maybe it's because Dennis Pop, a man who loved all things pop so much he changed his name, had an uncanny ability to recognize a hit sound. He inspired the team he created with his vision and his ambition, and they in turn will continue to pass on the baton. 20 years after his death, Dennis Pop's legacy shows no sign of ending. It's my life.